Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, once again, uh, welcome to the annual Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture. This year it's been put off, it had to be put off by a few weeks because the gentleman who's going to speak to us this evening had been invited to present his work uh, and to create an installation at the Venice Biennale, which opened uh, actually on the day of uh, of, of, uh, of, of the day on which uh, uh, Jeffrey Bauer died. Uh, for so, so for that reason, um, uh, we had to put, for, uh, put, put back the uh, date of the lecture, and therefore that's why it's late. Of course, I had the good fortune of being at Venice this year and uh, seeing Kashev's installation, which is a wonderful sort of glass maze, which is almost like the way us architects in our part of the world sometimes have to practice architecture, where you go up places that you don't often expect and you discover wonderful things and the end of that maze was a wonderful display of Kashev's work uh, which I'm sure all of you will enjoy this evening. In fact, I don't want to really take too much of your time. I'd rather have you spend that with him. Uh, but just a very short introduction to Kashev. Um, he's got a small, uh, he has, he's got a studio based practice uh, in Dhaka where he finds, he, he, he does work uh, which somehow relates to the roots of history and to materials and the climate and context, very much in the tradition uh, in which Jeffrey Bauer used to work here in Sri Lanka uh, in the years that he was in practice. Kashev has twice been finalist at the Aga Khan Award for Architecture and has also won first prize in the Architectural Review's AR plus D Awards in 2012. His works range from low-cost settlements to cultural institutions and corporate headquarters, I've had the good fortune of seeing some of his work, the wonderful memorial for the Bangladesh War of Independence, which is extremely beautiful piece of work, uh, along with two other mosques, one in a city, which I sort of bump, bumped into walking around the, the streets of Dhaka one day and wondered what was this beautiful building and someone said, Kashif Chowdhury's mosque. And of course, another beautiful work for a mosque that he had done in, uh, in Chittagong. Um, so his work is really very, very beautiful and I'm sure all of you will enjoy it. Uh, of course, Kashef also teaches in many institutions in Bangladesh. I've had the good fortune once again to be with him at one of the sessions we had at a school in Dhaka and uh, very much enjoyed that. Uh, he also is a photographer, takes a great interest in art, uh, and uh, of course is a sort of Renaissance man in that sense. But his architecture, I think, will speak for itself, although he will be around to explain it to you. So I'm not going to take any much more of your time, um, once again, we do this annually to remember Jeffrey Bauer, uh, now uh, in, I think it's 15th, uh, in its 14th year, and um, we hope you enjoy this evening uh, and Kashev's work. So let me introduce to you Kashev Chowdhury. Thank you, um, Channa. Uh, it's a very special moment for me um, to be here today. Um, yes, um, as I was saying, it's very special for me to be here today, and uh, I thank the Jeffrey Bauer Trust, um, Anjalendran, um, Channa, Priyanka, and everybody else who sort of made this possible. Um, before I take you to Bengal, where uh, most of my work is, uh, I'd like to sort of discuss um, why and how I do the things that I do. Um, and uh, for that, I've collected my thoughts in a text which I will read out. And then um, I will show you some of the projects and some of the works um, that I'm doing. Impressions. That feeling of being in the delta. Hot, humid, breezy, mosquitoes. Patches of green in a sea of greens. Look up and see an ocean in clouds. Gray, white, or the colors of the sun. Sun, that beautiful light I remember from my childhood. Slashes of afternoon on the golden of the straw. I remember the smell. I remember the sounds of the straw. When I said I love the rain, the sun, and everything in between, I meant I wanted to build to enjoy the rain, the sun, and everything in between. And where else but here, the home of the Brahmaputra and the Jamuna, 
wedded together in the softest soil, moist as the womb of the mother. Before the shadow of the rock, the Himalayas, the largest delta in the world, touches the waters of the bay. This is Bengal, a geocultural region woven out of an intricate network of rivers and canals to which all art forms respond, from the emotionally rendered Hawaiya songs and the colors of the stitches of Nokshi Katha textiles to the living and lost architecture of the Delta. Much of my childhood was spent by the side of the river Padma, which draws its waters from the Ganges. It is difficult to bring to words my memories of those waters, of the clouds, both above and soaked in reflection, and the finest and softest of all soils, the alluvial layers where the ground was still moist from receding waters. But it is not merely the impact of those elements. For me, a river is not the same again, or rain, or the darkness before a storm in monsoon. I have been forever changed by the spirituality of that land. The tropical light introduces us to the landscape of Bengal. The strong sun's light reveals the beauty of its nature. It falls on mountains, fields of paddy, and trees, but the rest is spilt light, lost light. It is the architect who, by the design of his apertures, brings in the spilt light into the deep insides of his architecture. He gives it shape, lets it play, or prevents it from removing his shadows. For with the darkness of shadows comes the appreciation of light, of the color of light, of the depth of light. Have you seen the depth of Khan's light at the National Assembly Building in Dhaka? Khan brings in a silvery light, playful as the water from which the building rises. Nowhere has a space been more gracefully lit than by the magical light of his tropical sun. I am in search of shadows, shadows under a banyan tree, behind a column, or from a dark cloud. Have you ever been in a forest, a temple, or in a village courtyard? Shadows have a wonderful way of celebrating the presence of light. They seem to say, we do not hide. Our purpose is to reveal. Too many times we have seen buildings naked, sunburnt, clad only in a curtain of glass. What is the purpose, I say? Let us not chase the shadows away. Then we are left with a pale, dead light, uninspiring, unnecessary. I return to the comfort of the shadow which the light has brought in. Materials, ask me not of materials. I'm still listening to the story of the clay earth millions of years before you have uncovered it, molded it, burnt it, for bricks or terracotta temples. I wish to know more, and I want to learn to care, like gold in the hands of a goldsmith. And oh, the textures, the imperfections, the feeling, the beckoning. The building doesn't need ornament. The material is the ornament. There was a time when I thought I couldn't live in the city. It was too powerful, too much happening in too little time. Then I realized it was possible to create your secret space in a city. It would be free from the rush elsewhere. It would have its own pace, its own time. Time. 
Is it true that if the sun hadn't moved, there wouldn't have been time? Or is it locked in a Swiss watch or in a Japanese pendulum? I like to leave time out of my buildings. I sense that leaves out a lot of other things, styles, trends, isms, and so on. I'm tired of efficient buildings, buildings that offer you not a moment to pause, to ponder, to wish, to recollect. Buildings that work well, better than you'd wish for, and give you nothing else. In an office or railway station, yes, but in a home or in front of art, in an art gallery, I look for a loss of time, absence of time. And then there arises the opportunity for serenity to invade and silence. The silence of a breeze, the silence of a deep sleep, the silence of a space. My work used to confuse me, but it was important to be confused. I sense in confusion lies the seeds of discovery, of truth. I drink a drink from the broth of seven or 10,000 years, thousand years of my history, and I feel alive again. The myth, the mystery, the mysticism, the emotion, the philosophy, the chaos, the romance. Yes, I'm in love with the Bengali way of life. Come away with me for an hour of the Sarod, and you will know what I mean. But ask me not of my work, for I create for the love of art. And ask me not of the present or of the future. I know neither. Architects embark not on a mission, but on a journey. A journey of learning and experiences, which proposes to the architect his various creative productions. And due to his culture, his inspirations, he distills his thought and work before it is brought to greater light. An architect learns more than he can ever make. And today, I will try to share with you some of my learning. The first project that I would like to show is um, where I live. It's, um, it's a project from 1997, uh, a plot of land which belonged to my mother and her siblings. Um, and I was, to, I was asked to design and construct the building. So it was a good opportunity for me to actually have a hands-on approach to construction. And on the top floor, there was this little apartment, uh, which I call a pavilion apartment, uh, because it is open to the elements. And um, it's very simply laid. It's a small one. And um, it has a court with a high volume. It's open to the elements. Every material here was sort of recycled, bricks from old buildings that were broken down in all part of the city. The stone that you see, travertine, from a project 10 years ago by a contractor, by a separate contractor. The roof of the court. channels to take away the rainwater, the sleeping area. The dining area. A reversal of elements of sorts, um, stone on the floor, uh, concrete on the table, copper kitchen. Chinitikri, broken china pieces in the bathroom, a tradition which goes back to hundreds of years. Everything in this project is handmade from hinges to doorknobs, tables. So stone, bricks. These bricks are actually hundreds of years old because they come from old buildings. Burmese teak, gunmetal, concrete, copper handworked, 
glass set in concrete. I work a lot with an NGO called Friendship, and this, is, this was one of my first projects. Um, um, in the north of the country, uh, where there's a lot of um, flooding, uh, there are people who live in the river. They, li they live on the islands in the river, and they're home, uh, landless people, so they would not shift. And so they're uh, in the water, in the flood, for three months a year. And so uh, instead of trying to raise individual houses, the project was to raise an entire settlement, an entire village. And our proposal was to sort of um, make an island uh, and have a pond in the middle. And um, the island took the shape of a teardrop because of studying the natural forms of islands that form in the river. And in the middle is this uh, pond I talked about and which collects the rainwater for cooking during floods. So this is the landscape. The river here is 10 kilometers wide, and during floods, it, it is an endless sea of water. So we worked with the villagers. It was a self-help income generating project in the sense the villagers themselves uh, moved their houses onto the raised plinth. We worked with AutoCAD drawings on one hand and with compass, very basic means, um, and it was a very interactive process. Uh, the villagers, as I said, they, they cut the earth, they moved their homes, uh, and they were paid to do it. So it was income generation as well. So this is uh, the layout, the earth cutting, the pond beginning to take shape, the uh, island sort of in the landscape, green begins to return. and life returns. So as I said, it was very interactive in the sense we gave them a layout for their houses and many times they made little changes and we learned from them why they made those changes for views or, or the southerly wind or um, for privacy. And um, it, it was a very, it was a two-way process in which, uh, and we did 10 projects uh, over a period of seven years. In, 2007, on the night of 15th of November, uh, the cyclone Siddur struck Bangladesh, uh, claiming 10,000 lives and um, uh, causing uh, damage um, to the amount of almost $2 billion. Uh, I was in Dhaka, um, and the, the next day, because there was new news pouring in, and my friends who were journalists, and you could um, hear the, the the sounds of people crying, and it was um, it was very difficult me, for me to be in the capital, which is um, in the middle of the country. And so, uh, myself and three others from my office, we took a boat and we traced the path of the cyclone. Uh, and we were on this boat for four days. And uh, everywhere we went, of course, there was devastation and loss of life. And I photographed, and we also made um, uh, recordings of the live conversations. And, um, and instead of uh, um, taking photographs of portraits, um, because of obviously the people are in trauma, uh, the idea was to um, uh, see them in their context. Uh, for example, this little girl has lost everyone in her family. She's the lone survivor. And she's looking towards the space where her house used to be. Um, and this is the place where the cyclone made landfall. And um, for example, we first we didn't understand what this boy was trying to say, but he's really pointing to, uh, to a point um, uh, where he tied himself to a branch of a tree and saved himself from the tidal surge. And it was 21 feet above where we were standing. So the water moved 21 feet above, and it was one kilometer uh, from the seashore. So we put all this together in a book and we tried to raise funds um, with the idea of building a cyclone shelter. Uh, we were not successful. Uh, but we did continue with the design of the shelter. There were many shelters in Bangladesh, which uh, there are more than two and a half thousand shelters, uh, which save millions of lives every time there's a threat of a cyclone. Um, but uh, based on our own first-hand experience, we thought we could um, sort of give our input. 
and the idea was to create um, a kind of an easily recognizable building because in the in the remote uh, coastal belt there are no postal addresses there are no streets or names and so um, it had to be easily recognizable and it had to spread by word of mouth and um, so what we came up with is a very simple cruciform building uh, which um, around which a ramp sort of wraps around and um, it would be used as a school um, during normal times, school and a clinic, and of course as a shelter during um, cyclones. So the, in the four corners we have the light and ventilation wells, uh, which sort of helps uh, ventilating during the cyclone because there's flying debris and there's danger of um, uh, the debris, uh, flying tin and other things, uh, crashing into the windows, etc. So this is how it would be used during normal times, but during a cyclone, the people would come in, we would remove uh, the furniture into stores, and uh, we also learned that people bring their cattle with them. And it was important uh, to understand this because it is everything they have, a cow or a goat is everything they have. And, and so uh, the ramp is um, used to take the cattle up to the roof and be saved from the tidal surge. Uh, instead of windows, we have concrete blocks in which the, the openings are set. And as I say, the, um, the ram sort of protects from um, hydraulic pressure and high wind. So uh, one has to imagine the situation. Uh, the cyclone sitter struck at midnight. There was no power, uh, water everywhere. It was a sea. And, um, uh, and there is fire associated with it. The wind speed is in excess of 250 kilometers per hour. And so uh, our design is a concrete building. It is only concrete, it's just one material. And, um, and the ramp sort of also protects uh, the inner areas. The roof becomes a play area for children. This building is off the grid. It has solar panels and hand-drawn tube wells in the, um, the toilets. So as I said, we, we designed this and we um, wanted to sort of build one, but uh, we could not raise funds for it. And we had an exhibition in Dhaka uh, where we had other projects. And for this project, there was, it was written Client Search. And there was this group from Luxembourg who came and found it interesting. And they, take, take, they took the entire exhibition to uh, Luxembourg and uh, sort of tried to uh, raise funds through that exhibition. And I'm happy to report that we did uh, raise funds for one project, uh, for one prototype, and it is now under construction in the coastal area in Bangladesh. Um, the, the Rainbow Warrior II was the ship for Greenpeace. Uh, this is the ship in the New York Harbor. And it, when it was retired, it was um, given to our client Friendship the NGO with the condition it will be uh, used for humanitarian purposes and um, so we decided to uh, they decided to convert this into a hospital boat um, and we were given uh, sort of um, asked to do this and of course we had no prior experience of working with a ship um, uh, and also uh, to do a hospital in t such tight spaces. So the basic idea was to sort of uh, clear the hull area and introduce the operating theaters, the recovery rooms, and make minimal changes because there was a lot of restriction from the agency, Germanisha Lloyd, who sort of uh, look into um, the various um, um, uh, sea going, because it's a sea going vessel, so uh, safety is of paramount importance. Um, I don't know if you can see this. In the middle, there's, there's a little uh, circular kind of an element. That is the only element we introduced into the existing body of the ship, which is a stair which takes the patients down directly into the lower areas where the operating theaters and uh, recovery rooms are. And um, so um, this is what it was. And with minimal budget, we transformed uh, into a very, uh, very tiny spaces of uh, operating theaters and recovery rooms and doctor's rooms. Uh, and so far, um, they have treated 200,000 patients. 
This is a mosque we were asked to do in uh, the port city of Chittagong in Bangladesh. And uh, when I first visited the site, the client said, you know, they wanted to break down this mosque because it was uh, not in a very good condition. Of course, we convinced them to sort of preserve it. And this became the sort of uh, generating idea for the whole design. And um, so the mosque on the right that you see is the old one, and on the left is the new one. And so the, uh, the, the old is at the front and the new is at the back and the past sort of comes to the fore and that was the very big, uh, that was the idea to sort of um, use the mosque as a background to the old one. And it's a very simple structure with, it's a singular space with a veranda all around it and uh, it's a high volume uh, space. And the only, it's a very uh, simple structure as I said uh, with, um, no, um, uh, it, it's a bare element, and the only kind of ornament is in the ceiling. So as you look up, as you go into the high space, uh, as you look up, you see the, the work in the ceiling. I'll show you some photographs. And also, uh, what we borrowed from the old structure is a motive which we transformed into a jolly, um, which we used in the, the, the new structure. So uh, this is it, and um, so instead of a dome, because uh, the client wanted a dome, and we, uh, we translated this into the rise, because the dome, the rise of the dome is something that I sort of worked with, and so now it's the rise of a cuboid volume, and uh, around it is a, is a kind of a plinth, kind of a base of the veranda structure. And so uh, um, we brought in light from above and uh, from the um, corners. I don't have very good photographs of this. This is being documented. Uh, it's, it's a complete building, but I don't have very good. It's all construction photos. Uh, this is the old one, which has been preserved, and the new one, as I said, is a backdrop. And it's in concrete and cast in wood. And um, the, the jali is um, in cast iron, but it is made to hang. So it, a very heavy uh, kind of a screen becomes light, and it floats above the water. And this is what you see when you go inside um, the glass set in concrete and uh, the corner windows. And the, the, the wood of the door sort of uh, follows the, the wood texture of the concrete casting, the veranda. The old mosque. So uh, we also, of course, do uh, work in the cities. And uh, this is the first apartment building condominium we did um, after many years of starting practice. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, Dhaka, now what I guess Colombo is going through now, uh, Dhaka had experienced uh, quite a long time ago, um, uh, uh, I think quite a responsible building, if you ask me. and. Um, and so in 2004, I did this installation, this exhibition at the Goethe Institute in Dhaka. The idea was to photograph uh, an X number of buildings. It was 748 buildings or something, a random number. To photograph these buildings in, with a plastic camera, one-time use and throw camera, um, just to sort of reflect uh, the idea that these, these buildings are not built with much care. And then when laid out on the floor in a grid, um, you, one could easily see the kind of pigeonhole kind of uh, uh, facades and the, and, and the kind of um, uh, what was happening to the urban fabric. And so when we got this uh, commission, which came with a very strange kind of a requirement, the, the developer, which is one of the biggest in Bangladesh, they asked for the most expensive apartments in, in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. So that was their brief. Um, so it's near a lake. Um, they said marble, um, expensive materials. And um, so it's a very small plot. So uh, the, the plan is four bedrooms to, to the corners and with cross ventilation. And all the services club together towards the west. Uh, the ground floor also as compact as possible. And uh, on the roof, on one side, uh, the um, infinity pool. And on the other side, a little infinity garden. So. Um, Various elements protect uh, and shade the building to reduce energy uh, consumption. And the uh, extension of the floor plate sort of give it a sense of ground plane 
to the apartments above. So of course we gave them a very simple building in concrete. We built it well, um, and uh, the only element of luxury is the real wood that is used on the outside um, uh, all around, and uh, which is protected by these deep overhangs. The roof garden. This is a project um, we won, uh, myself and my former partner, Marina Tabassum, uh, we won it in 1997 um, because um, the government wanted to sort of uh, recollect the happenings uh, in the war for liberation in uh, 1971. Uh, this is uh, the, the site, this is how it used to be in the, in the early 1900s. And then it became this, and later on, um, it, it was uh, the, the place from where the war literally started because of a historic speech by uh, the father of the nation. And uh, it is also here where the war ended after nine months of bloody guerrilla warfare, and um, it, the surrender actually took place in the same grounds. So, uh, so one of the winning ideas for this project was, um, let me see if I can. So one of the ideas was to, because there's this big museum and we realized if we had all these functions of the museum in the middle of the park-like area, um, uh, it, it was not really going uh, with, the, with the green and the open space. And so uh, the whole museum is sunk below grade and the roof of the museum then becomes a public plaza and uh, the plaza then becomes a teller of the history um, of, of those grounds and of, of the happenings um, during those months in 71. So as you sort of walk towards the main monument, you encounter a shallow pool of water which you see in the middle, um, and it has a hole in the center, so the water falls into the hole. It is like a black hole. It draws the water unto itself, and uh, it is like uh, the silent bearing of torture and genocide by people in, in villages and towns um, uh, by the uh, occupying forces. And from here, one can go into the, uh, the areas below grade uh, through the ramp, uh, which is in the wall that you see. So, um, so uh, the water falls into a central rotunda. This is the, the plan of the uh, underground area. Uh, the central rotunda uh, in which the water falls is the heart of the museum around which are um, the various display areas and also the little screening room, uh, the auditorium. And um, that is the section. So as you approach the museum and the monument, the ramp, So it is all in concrete, and uh, you can see stains in the concrete. It is because of political reasons this project was left to its own, um, and rain came in, it flooded, and the concrete sort of discolored, and I sort of uh, persuaded the authorities to leave it like this, because it is now, those marks are now part of the history of the building. And on the left, you see this black exhibit area, which has uh, images of the genocide and torture. And from there, as one is feeling emotional, one enters into the rotunda that you see, um, into this space, uh, in which the water falls from above through the only oculus in the ceiling through which the light comes. And in this area, which is devoid of any um, exhibits, one may take a moment to meditate and remember those fallen known and unknown. One continues uh, through the other exhibit areas. So here was an exercise um, to understand monumentality. Monumentality for me is not about uh, size or how big it is, it is about presence. And the monument itself um, is, is a tower. Um, it is a tower of glass. Uh, but our intention was to have a tower of light. And the only way we could get to light was through glass. And glass was not used as planes, but it was turned uh, to use the quality of
refraction, so the transparency and reflection, not those qualities, but the, the refraction of light through sections of glass, so glass 75 mil by one meter, placed one above the other, formed into panels. Uh, these prefab panels going into um, the vertical space from steel structure in the center and rising 150 or 46, 150 feet or 46 meters. And during the day, the sun's light sort of refracts and at night it becomes a beacon of light. This is the earlier mosque uh, we did in Chittagong. It was uh, shortlisted for the uh, Aga Khan Awards. Uh, it's a very simple uh, cuboid, two cuboid volumes. One as the mosque proper, the other one is the courtyard, which is again transformed into a volume. Here, um, it was an exercise to sort of uh, bring it down to the very minimum things, the essential element. It's not an exercise into minimalism, but rather into the essential elements that sort of might be important for a spiritual space. And uh, here it is in, a, in an urban periphery. And um, so the connections to the, the horizontal, to, the, to nature, uh, which represents the earthbound and to zenith or to the skies for the spiritual. The, the outer volume of the courtyard. So the client wanted a dome. They had to have a dome. And um, so I cut it because I wanted to express the non-spanning um, character of the dome. We don't need a dome to span spaces anymore. So uh, the dome was cut um, to become a giver of light, to bring in light and to take out light at night. in the landscape. We're doing a hospital uh, deep south uh, in the remote um, coastal area. And again, this is a very low budget hospital. It's, uh, it's a full functioning 80 bed uh, hospital. Uh, but for, in this area, the underground water is saline, it's unusable. So uh, we're trying to catch all the rainwater there is. And, um, and so in the, in the middle is this kind of a river uh, which sort of cracks through the ground and um, holds the water into the two tanks on either side of it. And, um, and it was important because for a hospital to function, it needed to be very efficient. So uh, um, in one direction, the, the services, then the, uh, in, in the vertical, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer here, maybe. Yes. So here the service, service spine, here the patient's movement. This is the inpatient, this is the outpatient. The inpatient and in outpatient being divided by the water so that the two um, the, do not mix. And then at the end is the residential sort of circulation. And here is the public, then the patients, and then restricted entrances and uh, the operating theaters. And then at the end, the services, the, the back of house services. So there, as, as the sort of river sort of meanders, um, the various courtyards shift, but when you stand in a courtyard, in a, in a, in a particular courtyard, it is orthogonal, it is, it is not um, twisted. It's difficult for me to explain this here, but um, it is something like this. So in, in a diagonal view, it sort of shifts, but in any space, it is orthogonal. So local bricks and uh, wood, um, local craftsmen. Um, this is um, now finishing. These are some of the photographs um, from the construction site. So very remote, getting materials is, is, um, is an issue. Um, 
but we have a very good contractor who's sort of taking the pains to construct well. So as Channa was saying, we were invited to Venice um, to participate at this year's um, um, Biennale. And I have a little kind of a video which sort of talks about uh, what we did. And so this is the proposal that we sent. Uh, it's titled, To Live is to be Slowly Born. Um, the idea is to say that our buildings rise slowly. And in the context that we operate, it's um, difficult uh, for us to sort of, uh, with the funding, the limitations and the constraints of funding and other problems. So the idea is, of course, a glass labyrinth that he already mentioned. Um, uh, it's in the central pavilion in the Giardini. And uh, so you cross the, um, the labyrinth to go into an inner landscape. And on the way, as you cross, there are these terracotta tiles which are contrasted by the laser etchings on it, which have the plans uh, and imprints of uh, archaeological sites and historical uh, buildings. So these little plans as they grow for the various, uh, for the four projects that are on display. Can we know what we want, but we cannot get there. So the glass labyrinth is similar in the way that you move through it, but you cannot cross it. You can see it, but you cannot cross it. You may get lost. You may not get to your destination. So uh, we use that as one of a, as a metaphor. And this inside this installation are the various displays that we are sort of the projects that we are showing. I have done quite a lot of projects with friendship, so I thought this might be a good idea to talk about the struggle that people face for whom friendship works and also for whom I work. And so maybe we can talk about these struggles and sort of talk about the architecture that sort of shapes um, humanity in, in many ways and sort of changes the lives, however little. I think it's quite interesting in the sense that um, the earlier exhibitions in Biennale, the Biennales were, I think, uh, about big architectural works and mega projects, but this time I think it's about the various frontiers. And for me personally that's important because I like to look at architecture as an act of social responsibility. It's just not about me or us, it's not just about art or culture, it's also about social response and responding to the climate, the changing climate. And in Bangladesh you know that climate change is a very important factor. And so to respond to all this through our projects, to talk about this in a very different context, thousands of miles away in Venice, I think it's quite interesting for us. And also to sort of share these ideas with people who probably will never come to Bangladesh or are not aware of the various conditions under which we sort of work and operate. Uh, the last project that I want to show is the Friendship Center in the rural north of Bangladesh. Um, uh, this is uh, how I found uh, the site when I reached, um, uh, when I went there for the first time. So Friendship acquired the site uh, at a quite a, a, a cheap rate because um, it was lowland, it was paddy fields, and prone to heavy flooding. And um, so um, as we started construction, of course, you can see that it's a very rudimentary and very basic ways of constructing um, layout, for example, and working in the mud, the foundations. But uh, because we had to come above the level of floods, uh, highest recorded flood level was about eight feet. And in trying to raise the entire complex, we were losing almost the entire budget just trying to raise above that level. And, uh, and, and so this project was not working out. And uh, we did two designs which failed because we just didn't have the money for it. And for the third and the final design, I was looking at it. And, and this is the conventional approach that we were sort of trying in the first one. And, um, and I realized that our design, our solution was here, not there, but really here, where um, we can occupy the space instead of sort of raising it. And uh, so we built on existing low ground, um, 
like this and protected the entire complex from floods by a mini embankment. With this came the attendant problem of rainwater getting collected uh, within the areas of the embankment and we introduced a series of uh, tanks and pools to collect this and also um, a network of septic tanks so that sewage does not mix with flood water during floods. Again, there's a little video at the end, so I'll just briefly go through this. This is uh, the project as it is. This is the elevation from the roadside. Um, the resulting ele elevation, which worked quite well in the sense uh, it was very difficult to relate to the rural uh, agricultural landscape, but here you almost don't see the building because it is built so low. It is not sunken, it is just built low. And uh, of course, the building was very much inspired by the ruins of Buddhist monasteries in the, in, in the region, um, in the area. These are some of the ruins. There's a book out on it, just out on this. Um, I think there's a copy here, and I think there's another copy at the Jeffrey Bauer Trust if you'd like to take a look. And I think it's also now available on Amazon. So the, the green roof sort of uh, extends into the landscape. So it's a weave of pavilions, gardens, and pools. So in the very limited budget that we had um, and other constraints, um, uh, the only sort of luxury we could sort of give to its users is the um, luxury of light and shadows. The dining pavilion. Everything is local, made at site. The furniture, all the furniture we made, it was a very low budget, but everything we made uh, with local wood. and bricks. The brickwork is just a kilometer from site. This is the film made by the Aga Khan um, Award for Architecture. I always say man makes his marks in life. Man builds and leaves his mark in the landscape. Architect Kashef Chowdhury is the designer of the Friendship Center in Bangladesh. Friendship is a non-governmental organization uh, who work with some of the poorest of poor in this, um, in this part of the world. Um, they wanted a kind of a training meeting center uh, for their various projects in healthcare, education, so um, we did this project for them. Kashef Chowdhury drew his inspiration from the Buddhist monastery of Mahastan. The most guiding uh, inspiration was um, the, the ruins of Buddhist monasteries um, and settlements from 3rd century BC onwards, which are not very far away from here. In Mahastan, for example, you see the similar kind of handmade bricks. These are beautiful uh, materials uh, in the sense they're handmade. Um, it has the, the imperfections that give it the texture. And it was very important for me to relate to 3,000 years of history and archaeology. So um, the Friendship Center is essentially arranged in uh, two blocks, the residential uh, block, uh, which has the dormitories and the staff quarters and the dining pavilion. On the other side is uh, the training pavilion where people sit on the floor um, for various kinds of training programs, including um, theater. So um, Friendship organizes uh, theaters which uh, really deal with um, uh, things like child marriage, um, women empowerment. So it's difficult to get these messages through to the people. Uh, they're being quite illiterate. 
During the rainy season that lasts for six months, temperatures can vary between 25 to 35 degrees Celsius. So one of the ideas was to have broken forms and pavilions, uh, open spaces, because then uh, we could have the natural ventilation. Um, and in addition, we have the green roof on the, on the top, which is uh, really helping uh, as a thermal mass, uh, reducing the solar heat. The result is that um, we can avoid the use of air conditioning by using cross ventilation. It's a good time to come back to that point where we look at architecture not just as art, but really as responding to the context or to the people for whom we built. Thank you. Presentation. Um, I, while we have him here on stage, if any of you have any questions about his work and his life in Bangladesh, uh, please be kind enough to ask. I'm sure he'll be willing to answer. Um, so I'll open the... Can you hear me? Yeah. No? Yeah. I'm a journalist representing from Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation. My name is Lenny Namaravikrama. Uh, I have a guru from Bangladesh called Mr. Humayun Chaudhary, similar to your surname. So my question is that uh, how your religion, Islamic religion, allows you to change the nature of the structures of the mosque uh, into present context as you described in the uh, uh, lecture. Um, well, it's very simple. If you look at the design of churches, for example, uh, if you look at the design of basilicas and, and uh, the older cathedrals, that has shifted. And in the, in the contemporary churches, one realizes that one can use light and other materials, simple materials, to sort of come down and sort of uh, clarify uh, the space. And I think in the mosques, it's, it's even easier because uh, the mosque is really a place of prayer, and that's it. There is no ritual as such. And so it is possible to sort of um, remove everything and just have a kind of a shelter and a direction of prayers. And that is how um, sort of uh, I started uh, with the, the white mosque that I showed you. And um, uh, there's no complaint, and uh, there can be no complaints um, because technically it is, it is not wrong. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, the last project, the Friendship Center, that had that soft bund around it, which you said was to keep the water out. Um, how, how does it actually function when it's flooding? Or how does it, because there are openings in those bunds, right? So how, do you, how does it work? Um, well, um, interestingly, uh, it's, it's very simple. It's just an earth berm. So it's compacted earth. Um, and it's all around, as I said. Um, you can walk on it, but there are no holes, because if there's a hole, it will break uh, when the water comes in. This was put to test um, last uh, season, uh, in November of last year, because uh, we had a um, big flood, and uh, the water outside was four and a half feet above the, the level, the floor level uh, inside, and the water stayed there for about three weeks, and this berm was able to protect um, um, Touchwood. It was able to protect it well. And uh, so we saved a lot of money. We, in, in Bangladesh Takas, we actually saved about four and a half crores. The budget for the project was uh, quarter to uh, 3.475 crores. So we saved just, just the total amount of budget we had, an equal amount we saved because of the, of the berm. Yes, it's been a very clear presentation, so there's not many more questions. Uh, I'm, I just take this opportunity to thank you very much, Tashe, for coming Pleasure. and making this presentation um, on, on behalf of the Jeffrey Bawa Trust. Um, I also need to thank a few other people. Um, one is um, Mr. Miles Young, who usually sort of sponsors the uh, speakers' travel to Sri Lanka, so we thank Miles. Uh, he's been doing this for many years now, uh, and we thank him very much for supporting the Jeffrey Bauer Trust in the way they have done. 
Uh, I also need to thank on behalf of the trust our uh, manager Priyanka who's worked really hard to organize the various uh, 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 travel arrangements, etc. Uh, particularly when uh, Kashif had to change his dates, we had already sort of organized for the 27th when Kashif was invited to go to Venice uh, and we had to make those changes and Priyanka was really very good at coordinating all of that. So thank you Priyanka for all the work you do uh, to make this uh, a success. Uh, and of course, last but not least, I need to thank all of you for coming in your numbers to uh, both listen to uh, hopefully uh, the presentation by a very good architect, which we try to do every year, uh, and also uh, to honor uh, Jeffrey Bauer, who was perhaps uh, Sri Lanka's best known architect and changed the way we look at ourselves as uh, Sri Lankans. Uh, so thank you very much indeed uh, for this evening. And uh, once again, perhaps we'll meet again uh, next year uh, at the Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture. Um, I need to also tell you that that's the book that's available, uh, which has just been published. Uh, it appears uh, it's uh, photographs done by an incredibly good photographer as well, uh, Ellen Bine, who photographed uh, two of Jeffrey Bava's iconic buildings, uh, Lunuganga uh, and the Ina de Silva House, um, when he was awarded the Chairman's Award for the Aga Khan. And uh, her photographs in this book are also very, very beautiful and depicts the last project that uh, Kashif showed us uh, in, 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 uh, in a lot of detail and very, very beautifully indeed. Uh, so I think that's available, as he said, on uh, Amazon. And it's a, it's a really beautiful book and can be recommended. So thank you very much. And I think uh, there is uh, some tea and uh, refreshments outside. Um, so we'll perhaps talk at that point. Thank you very much. <laughs>